So, but uh, with that being said, so this is joined with Robert Lipschitz. And so what I'll talk about, uh, yeah, let me just try to get to the theorems, uh, so, or, or the definitions rather in this case. So, so what we will do is like, I'll, we'll try to define a mixed invariant in Kobana homology associated to non-orientable cobordisms, okay? So this will be associated to non-orientable cobordisms. This is uh, associated to non-orient, when you'll see the definition, it really requires the cobordism to be non-orient, non-oriented, non-orientable cobordisms, uh, f inside uh, zero one times s three, um, and uh, it's in it's very analogous to uh, the construction of mixed invariants in Higgard floor homology. I mean, I mean, really, most of our definitions and most of our proofs are just borrowed verbatim from Peter Ojwat and Zoltan Zappos. So similar to mixed invariance in Higgard fluor homology, which is due to Ojwat and Zappos. Okay, some things are slightly different, but so I'll get to that. Okay, and and our our uh, condition that so if you know this mixed invariant story in Higgard floor homology, so our condition that our cobordism is non-orientable is similar to the condition that in Higgard floor homology you require B two plus to be greater than or equal to two. So it's kind of like that. So actually, our cobordism or they had did not. Okay, so so how do we define it? Okay, so let's get to it. So we are, um, so, so, well, first story is first. So there is something called Kovana homology, right? So this is like, so I'll denote it C hat. So the notation, we are also using similar notation to Higgard floor homology. So this is like the Kovanov chain complex, okay? You either know it or you don't know it. And in either case, it's fine, okay? I'm not going to give you the definition of the Kovanov chain complex. You just like, it's a chain complex that one associates to a link diagram. So if L is a link diagram, let's say, L is, you know, you can think of it as a link or a link diagram, either is fine. So associated to that, you associate a chain complex and that's due to Kovanov, okay? So, and it's a chain complex if you can define over integers, that's fine. But then there are some, uh, uh, and and it's like its homology is a, uh, its chain homotopy type is a link invariant. It doesn't depend on the diagram and everything. Now uh, it actually has several perturbations, and the first one was kind of due to Lee. So there is like something called Lee perturbation. Perturbation. There were similarly other perturbations by Barnerton. There is also a Barnerton perturbation, and so on. And the story that I'm going to tell you works for Lee perturbations. It also works for Bernerton perturbations. It really works for most of these things. But just to be specific, let's just concentrate on the Lee perturbation for this talk. Okay? So I'll just concentrate on the Lee thing. And so what the Lee perturbation is, is it's a chain complex, which I'll call C minus. So C minus of L, this is the Lee. This is the Lee perturbation. So if the Kovanov chain complex was a chain complex over some ring R, R is any ring really. R is your ring, your favorite ring of your choice, like it could be integers. Then the Lee perturbation is actually a chain complex over R with a polynomial variable, which is typically denoted T, either big T or little t, but anyway, it's typically denoted T. So it's a chain complex over this polynomial ring, okay? And uh, we have one condition. So here R could be any ring, but R is uh, actually any ring uh, where two is invertible, any ring which contains half, any ring with half. Okay, so it, integers is no longer an option, but people typically think of rationals, you know, like rationals. You know, any anything where two is invertible. So, but I'm, I'm not going to, but, but other than that, you really can choose any ring. And so I, I'll just always assume that we have fixed a ring and then it's a chain complex, the extra polynomial variable T, and it's actually the way it's defined, it's a free chain complex over this thing. So the chain group is free. So I'll just like, it's really important. So the chain group is free over this ring, over R adjoint T, okay? And then in what sense is this a perturbation? Well, the original Kovanov chain complex, you get from the Lee chain complex by setting T equals zero, okay? So this is like, so, so this is the theory. And then the reason I'm using these notations is because, well, 
if you know Higgard floor homology, this is kind of exactly a similar thing that happens in Higgard floor homology. So in Higgard floor homology, there is also a minus version, there is a hat version and all those things. And the hat version is obtained from the minus version by setting the polynomial variable to be zero. Okay. But in general, it's a chain complex over like a bigger ring. Okay. And so just staying analogous to, uh, so we'll call it the minus version instead of calling it the leap perturbation. So we'll just start calling. So, you know, we're going to call this the hat theory. We are going to call this the minus theory, you know, and then, um, by the way, what do I mean? Like are, these are all associated to link diagrams, but their chain homotopy type is a link invariant. So uh, let, let me just write it because that's the important thing. So the chain homotopy type of the C minus over this ring, over this ring, is a link invariant okay so and that's like the, the the sort of the strongest link invariant that comes out of this perturbation because the chain homotopy type actually contains much more information than just the homology okay so so chain homotopy type is like so of course homology is an invariant of the chain homotopy type but many other things you just get from the chain homotopy type so the other things that you get from the chain homotopy type again staying analogous to here floor homology is that you can define something called an infinity thing which is C minus tensor over RT with RT T inverse. So what I have done is like I've basically localized a T, I've inverted T. So another way of writing this would be like T inverse of C minus. So I, I've, I've just localized that T, just introduced our negative powers of T. So I can do that. So that's the infinity, that's called the infinity version. Let me just keep writing. This is called the infinity version. And then uh, you'll notice that because C hat was free, because C hat was free, so if I uh, if I sort of localize a T, then C minus is automatically a subcomplex. So this is a subcomplex of C infinity in a natural way. So this is a subcomplex. I basically can take its quotient, C infinity mod C minus, and I call it C plus. So this is the quotient. So this is called the plus version. Okay, and then these are all modules over the same ring, right? So, so, so C, C minus was a module over, sorry, C minus, if I have the minus thing, that's a module over this ring. And C infinity, so this is actually a free module over this ring. So, but C infinity is also a module over that ring. So everything is a module over this ring. And C plus is also a module over this ring, although it behaves very, very differently. Like for instance, C minus is actually free over this ring, but the way we have defined C plus, every element is T torsion actually in C plus. So C plus is like just the opposite of free. Like every element eventually gets killed by some sufficiently high, high power of T. So every, every element is sort of what, what we call T torsion. Okay, so this is kind of the opposite of free. But that's that's the story and so it it's just so far just algebra okay you either know the definition of where this is coming from or just like accept that there is some chain complex c minus like this from where we can play this game and then uh, in particular if i have a short exact sequence of chain complexes i get a long exact sequence in their homology so this is a short exact sequence this is a short exact sequence and similarly there is a corresponding long exact sequence of their homologies which i'm calling h minus h infinity h plus and you know goes back to h minus and so on okay there is a long exact sequence in their homologies and this um, entire long exact sequence i mean this all everything is a link invariant everything is a link invariant because everything uh, you can get from the chain homotopy type because the chain homotopy type is sort of the master invariant everything you can get from there Okay, good. Any questions with the structure? So these are the invariants that we're going to play with. Okay, so let's let's keep going in that case. So, um, so yeah. So, but the main thing to know is like the, this. This is sort of the structure. Okay. So now, uh, so Kovanov homology is functorial. The next thing, Kovanov homology, as well as its Lee perturbation, Kovanov, Lee, these are all functorial. 
and this was proved by you know so i think kovanov was wrote down the maps but then jacobson first checked it and then it was like proved by many many other people okay so i'll just like write a bunch of names but uh so this was first sort of done by kovanov then there is jacobson who checked it but then there are alternate proofs that was given by barnerton and kovanov you know uh, anyway so there is like people checked so first it was only well defined up to a sign but then people checked that it works with signs uh, first, it was only cobordisms in R3, but then people checked that it also works in S3. Anyway, so, so th there is really a lot of people to cite here. I will just, you know, maybe be lazy and not mention them. But, um, but long story short, what this means is that if you if you have a cobordism in S3 times, so if F is a cobordism in uh, 0, 1 times S3, um, from say a link from l0 inside 0 times s3 to l1 inside 1 times 1 times s3 so i'll draw the picture i mean the picture maybe is helpful or not uh, so here is uh, 0 1 times s3 and then there is a link on this side which is l0 there is a link on this side which is l1 and then there is a surface which is maybe uh, has genus and things like that. Uh, so that's your cobordism. Uh, then there is an associated map from uh, the, let's say that uh, from C minus of L0 to C minus of L1 associated, let's, let's call this map C minus of F, you know, why not? So there is an associated map of, uh, of RT chain complexes, of RT chain complexes, and the homotopy, the homotopy type of the map is an invariant. So I'll just write this. So the homotopy type of this map is an invariant of uh, of f, and 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 really not just of f. I mean, you can even change f. You can also change f by isotopy, and it doesn't change. So in, in fact, up to diffeomorphism. So up to diffeomorphisms of up to diffeomorphisms of 0 1 times s3 but real boundary you cannot change the boundary so you can even like apply any diffeomorphism you like of this 0 1 times s3 but only in the interior you can like change it by not just isotopy by diffeomorphisms so i think it's currently unknown if diffeomorphisms real boundary are same as isotopies of 0 1 times s3 because it's four manifolds we don't know anything about four manifolds, but 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 really, you can do any diffeomorphism of the thing inside a relative boundary, and the chain homotopy type of this map doesn't change. So in particular, like it induces maps in all theories. So 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 I get so we get maps in like you know in C plus C minus C infinity. Um, they are homologies. So we. We get well-defined maps in everything. They are homologies. Uh, they all commute with the commuting with the long exact sequence, etc. Everything that you get from the chain homotopy type, we get maps in all of those theories. So this is some theorem. It's like a lot of checks that went into it, you know. But 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 that's fine. This exists. It's such a map. This map is only well-defined up to a sign. Let me. So so this actually a so few things. Uh, in most of the literature, when this map is written, it's only written for orientable f. But actually, most of the things go through for non-orientable f. So I'll just mention this because our talk is on non-orientable surfaces. So f can be non-orientable. F can be non-orientable. Orientable. Orientable. F can be non-orientable. Um, but if f was orientable there is a way to make this map work with signs if f is non-orientable this map is only well defined up to an overall sign so that's fine it's like so uh well defined up to an overall sign so that's that's part of the thing but uh but but really it can be non-orientable uh, and then if you know about this map you will or if you know about kovanov homology already 
So there is like uh, covalent homology actually has two gradings. There is some grading called the homological grading that's always there for a chain complex, but there is an extra grading called quantum gradings. So this map doesn't preserve the gradings. Okay, so it changes the homological grading and quantum grading in some well-defined ways. Okay, so depending on the Euler characteristic of the surface. So it changes this by grading depending on the Euler characteristic of the surface. Now, if F is non-orientable, then this change of grading also depends on what we call the normal Euler number. Okay, so so there is like, so there is a, so I'm, I have not talked about the grading, so I won't start talking about the grading, but so the by grading, shifts depend only on the Euler characteristic. So that's always true. Euler characteristic, that's true even for non, even for orientable surfaces. And what one calls the normal Euler number. Okay, so the normal Euler number is a new thing that's there for non-orientable surfaces. So for orientable surfaces, normal Euler number is zero. So you don't see it for orientable cobordisms, but the moment you start looking at non-orientable cobordisms, there is a grading shift which depends on the normal Euler number. So I think the Euler, so these are both by Euler, but thankfully people use chi for Euler characteristic, so we get to use E for Euler number. So, so I think the grading shifts, I don't remember this, but I think the grading shifts are like, uh, let me try to guess minus e by 2 and like chi minus 3 e by 2 or something like that. I mean, let's say question mark up to science. It's kind of like that, but you know, you can look at the paper. But yeah, so there is like a, so the, the normal Euler number is always an even number. So it's kind of like that. Okay, so don't don't cite that. Yeah, so any questions up to here? Um, I'm still sort of giving an axiomatic talk. I'm just telling you what happens. Okay, so, 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 but again, summary is that there is something called common homology with perturbation C, like minus plus hat theory, minus plus infinity theories. And we have maps in all these theories associated to cobordisms, orientable or not. Like they could be non orientable, but then the maps are only well defined up to an overall sign. And there are some bigrading shifts, which are very well understood. I mean, no problem. Okay, so, so now we get to like the definition of the mixed invariants. Okay, so, so in particular, we actually already have invariants of cobordisms, like orientable or not, namely these maps are invariants of cobordisms. So these maps are already pretty strong invariants of cobordisms. Okay, so we, we, we have them already. So the only thing we are doing is like we are constructing some extra invariant of cobordisms that you may not, uh, uh, that you may not immediately see. And that's because it's sort of associated to Higgard floor homology. In Higgard floor homology, there is an extra invariant of cobordisms that you can do, which is in addition to these maps. Okay, so this extra invariant is as follows. So, so the mixed invariant, mixed invariant. So, now f this time this is the first time we need your surface to be actually non-orientable so it's non-orientable and the cross cap number but not necessarily connected not not necessarily connected we don't need to be connected you need at least one component to be non-orientable but the cross cap number is at least three so what is the cross cap number again we are using this fancy words for non-orientable things it's basically the number of rp2 bars like if you write your surface as a so uh, okay let's just for the simplicity for this talk like let's say say it's connected let's say f is connected for this talk uh, so if f is a connected non-orientable cobordism um the cross cap number is basically the number of rp2s so if af is written as a uh, connect sum of like topologically it's connected sum of k rp2 rp2s then k is the cross cap number cross cap number i mean sorry connect sum of k rp2s minus minus a bunch of disks minus a bunch of disks I mean, just boundary. So minus a bunch of disks, then K is a number, is a, called the cross cap number. Okay, so I need at least three RP2s. Uh, so this is this is this is exactly the condition. Like you know, like this is analogous to, to the condition that B2 plus is at least two in Higgard floor homology. So if you know Higgard floor homology, there is a condition, somehow a strange condition, that B2 plus has to be at least two. This is exactly like our condition that cross cap number has to be at least three. Okay, so then. 
But then how do I define the mixed invariant? Well, the mixed invariant, we call it, I think, phi f. Phi f is a map from the minus homology of the starting link to the plus homology of the ending link. Okay, so that's why it's called mixed. I mean, it goes from the minus theory to the plus theory. Okay, so it's, so that, that's the thing, and it's an invariant. So there is a map like this, and this is an invariant. This is an invariant of f, you know, as, as before. It's up to diffeomorphisms, up to diffeomorphisms of 0, 1 times S3. Uh, it's an invariant of f, up to um, a rail boundary. And again, remember, up to an overall sign, up to, and we don't get to re get rid of that, up to an overall sign. So this map up to an overall sign is an invariant of this surface. So how do we define it? We define it exactly analogous to, so, so this is this is the structure of the invariant. And it's defined exactly analogous to the mixed invariant in Higgard floor homology. Namely, what we do is we, const so the, here is the definition, construction. So we, maybe it's better if I just um, draw a picture once again. So let's go back to this thing. So here was my link, here was my L0, here is L1, here is my non-orientable cobordism. I don't know, I'm looking, it looks like orientable cobordism, but it's some non-orientable cobordism. Um, what I do is that I choose an embedded S3 inside the interior, okay, which separates the two boundary component. So this is so you have to like make a choice. So choose an embedded S3 inside the interior, 0, 1 times S3, uh, separating separating the two sides. So um it's not careful with colors, but let's take say purple. So it's some sort of separating S3 like this. It doesn't have to be straight. It's some sort of a complicated S3. Doesn't matter. Um, this is some S3. So that both sides are products. So that both sides are diffeomorphic to 0, 1 times S3. Both sides are products. And if uh, intersect each side, is still non-orientable. So of course I know the whole f is non-orientable, but on either side of the thing it's still non-orientable. It's of course possible to choose a cut where uh, both sides is orientable. That's not what I want. I want both sides, both the left side and the right side, to actually stay non-orientable. So that's why you see. So if both sides have to be non-orientable, so this is like this sort of clearly forces the cross cap number to be at least two right because uh, it's non-orientable on the left it's non-orientable on the right so there is a cross cap number one on the left there's a cross cap number one on the right so i have to have definitely have cross cap number at least two so you see that why i why, why i kind of get this condition so i have said that cross cap number at least three but you, you see like to even to start having this sort of a cut so such a cut is called an admissible cut so we call such a cut an admissible cut Again, the same word as Higgard floor homology. So to even have an admissible cut, I need to have a cross cap number at least two. Okay. So there is a lemma, and maybe if we have time, I can even give you a proof that uh, lemma is that if cross cap number is at least two, then uh, there exists an admissible cut. Okay, it's not obvious, hopefully, because this everything is embedded. Okay, so there is this surface. I mean, I, I know cross cap number is at least two. So I know that the surface at least has two RP2s. Okay, so there are at least two RP2s inside the surface, but it may not be obvious how I can separate the two RP2s by some sort of a strange cut where one RP2 is on this side and one RP2 is on the other side. Okay, because I have to do it in some sort of an embedded fashion where both sides are still products. So hopefully this is not totally obvious, but it's not very hard. So, okay, but um, but if the cross-cap number is at least two, then there is some admissible cut, okay? That's one thing. So we start with an admissible cut like this. 
then what do I do? Well, because each side is sort of homeom uh, diffeomorphic to a product, I can apply the diffeomorphism. I can actually apply it simultaneously on both sides. So, so you apply the diffeomorphism. So, um, apply the diffeomorphism. So, make it sort of straight. So, in other words, your uh, sort of situation looks like this. That here is your original cobordism. Here is your cut. That is actually half comma S3. Okay, so this is 0, comma S3, 0 times S3, 1 times S3, and this cut is actually at half times S3, and your surface is kind of like this. Okay, so it has a starting link L0, there is a middle link L1, sorry, there is ending link L1, and the middle link, we just call it L. So there is a link in the middle, we just call it L. So so it cuts it transversely at like three cut, three links, I mean, I had to ensure that the cut actually intersects the surface transversely. Okay, so as it does, so the cut intersects the surface transversely. And so there's a middle link and there's an end link. Okay, so I have a picture like this. Uh, any questions up to here? Okay, so, and then I have assumed that the cross cap number on the left side, so cross cap number is at least one, and the, so both sides are non-orientable and the cross cap number is at least one on the on both sides so both sides are non-orientable so now i get maps um so then there is a theorem this is by jake rasmussen we need to know, use this the theorem so jake Rasmussen actually he doesn't write it but it follows from his paper actually that uh, that if i have a non-orientable cobordism then the map on the infinity version is zero so non-orient this is actually the place where we use non-orientable cobordisms so non-orientable cobordisms induce the zero map on the infinity on h infinity let's just call it on h infinity okay he doesn't write it because he does actually doesn't use non-orientable cobordisms at all in his paper in his paper on lee theory but but actually, if you just go through his paper and like you just uh, allow your surfaces to be non-orientable cobordisms, you just get this result for free. Okay, so so it's kind of there. Um, um, so what what is the implication of that? So let's see. So now let's look at the. So let, let me call this the left side and this the right side. So this is the left side, and this is the right side. Okay. So so then on the left side, I have a map on the minus thing. Oh, by the way, remember, I have a short exact sequence like this. H minus goes to H infinity, goes to H plus, and then it goes back to H minus. So there is a long exact sequence like this. Keep this in mind. There is a long exact sequence, and keep this in mind. The non-orientable cobordisms induce a zero map on the infinity theory. Now, on the left side, I have a map from H minus of L, zero, to H minus of L. So the left cobordism induces a map from H minus of L0 to H minus of L. Okay, but I can use this long exact sequence map. So H minus maps to H infinity. So H minus maps to H infinity of L0, and that maps to H infinity of L. And then by Rasmussen, I know that this map is zero. Okay, so this map is zero. Very good. Now let's look at the right side. So the right side. So right side is right here. Um, you know what? I should most really need a little bit more space. This is something I can do here on Zoom and not on Blackboard. I will just pull it down. Very good. So so on the right hand side, I um, So uh, let, let me look at the long exact sequence in the middle. So this is the left side, there is the right side, but let's look at the long exact sequence in the middle. So the long exact sequence in the middle, there is an H plus of L, and there is also an H infinity of L. So this is the long exact sequence in the middle. So I'm really concentrating on the middle. So on the middle, maybe I needed more space, but that's okay. So, so this is the long exact sequence in the middle. Now, because this does square commutes, like this square commutes, this is from the left cobordism. So if I go this way, I get the zero map. So if I go like this, I get the zero map. So uh, 
So if I go, so uh, so I have this like this um, this map from h plus of l to h minus of l, okay, and so there is a group that kind of lives in the in between. Uh, how do I write this? So this is just long exact sequence stuff. Uh, uh, so when I look at, so there is this thing that H minus goes to H plus, and then I can look at, so let's call this map F. So I can look at the co-kernel of F, and then this actually same, is same as the kernel of G, where G is the map from H minus to H infinity. So if G is the map from H minus to H infinity, then because this is long exact, so the so this is the long exact sequence, so then co kernel of f is same as the kernel of g right so there is some this group which is co kernel of f or kernel of g that group sits in the bit in between and in higert floor homology this group that sits between h plus and h minus this group is called h red okay i don't do it in green but it's called h red so look at this time i'll draw it in red okay so there is this group called h red that sits in between so this is actually the long exact sequence. This vertical thing is the long exact sequence, but there is this thing called H red, which is basically the kernel of this lower map. It's also the co-kernel of the upper map. Okay, this is both the kernel and the co-kernel. Okay. The reason it's called H red is because they call it H reduced, the reduced homology, but it has nothing to do with the reduced Kovana homology. Okay, so let me just call it H red. But because this first map is zero, this composition is zero, so this actually lifts to the kernel. So this lifts to the kernel. So there's a map from H minus to H red. It lifts. There is a unique lift. Okay. So now let me look at the right hand side. So this was the left hand side. And now if I look at the right hand side, I, yeah, I don't really have space for it. So I'll just erase this. Uh... So if now if I look at the right hand side, I have an induced map on H infinity to h infinity of l1 so remember on the right hand side i have a cobordism from l to l1 so because i have a cobordism from l to l1 i have an induced map but that map is zero but i also have a map on h plus so h plus of l1 and because this square commutes because this square commutes and the top map is zero that basically means that i get a map induced map from the co-kernel so i have an induced map from the co-kernel to this guy Okay, so so then so I'm basically using the fact that the h infinity map is zero on the left, and I'm also using the fact that the h infinity map is zero on the right. So I'm using both of this, and then I get sort of, and then I get that the left map lifts to h red, and the right map factors through h red. So then I can compose. So I can basically compose this, and this is the mixed invariant. So this composition map is the mixed invariant. This map is phi f. Okay, is this okay? So this is just sort of algebra, but um, like, uh, and it's using this Rasmussen theorem, Jake's theorem that uh, for non-orientable cobordisms induce a zero map. So it's really, really important that uh, the cobord, the original cobordism was non-orientable. Non In fact, it's really important that they actually had cross cap number two, because then I can choose an admissible cut. So I have to be able to choose an admissible cut so that the surface, the cobordism on either side is non-orientable. And if the cobordism on either side is non-orientable, then I get to apply Jake's theorem, and then I get to play this game. Okay. Otherwise, it like I, I don't get to define this invariant at all. Okay. So so that's important. If yeah. If cobordism is non-orientable, is orientable, then you can always do like a couple of real blow-ups, and oh, but then you. I mean, you, you can introduce, like, you can connect some with the small... That's like... right, that's right, very good. I'll actually come back to that, that's right. So you can always, like, take a connect sum with, like, an unknotted RP2, or an RP2 bar, actually, whichever you want. So there are two RP2s, like, depending on their normal Euler number. So you can co always connect some with, like, unknotted RP2 or RP2 bars. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we prove something. So then, then in, towards the end of the paper, we say, like, what is the effect of like connect summing with an unknotted RP2 or RP2 bar on this like mixed invariant. And the answer is that it vanishes. So, so, so. Oh, oh so this way you could somehow see that there are, there are some sort of, it's not connected some with the three. That's right, that's right. So yeah, yeah. So, so a connect summing with RP2 is like not a great operation like to get, that's, that's right. But you get to say something right from that. Yes. That's I right. Mean, you can detect the existence of a sort of a trivial uh, RP2 Salmon. 
That, that's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah. So so there are some vanishing results. But yeah. So that's the definition. Uh, uh, so I'll just briefly say where do we need cross cap number at least three? So it looks like the definition just needs cross cap number at least two. That's because well, you also have to prove invariance. And so just to define this, it requires that there is an admissible cut. But to show independence of admissible cut, we actually need cross cap number three. Okay. So 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 during the proof of invariance during the proof of invariance which i'll at all not get into this i mean we need cross cap number uh, at least three okay so uh, so we need an extra cross cap number to sort of move the admissible surface around okay so it's like and actually this is uh, this is analogous to ojwad zabo's mixed invariant as well because when they prove invariance they also need b2 plus to be at least three like the to, to define it they need b2 plus to be at least two but when they prove invariance they need b2 plus to be at least three but then they get to do an extra lemma later on which says that oh b2 plus greater than or equal to two is enough okay but yeah. for a long time they need b2 plus at least three we don't get to do this extra lemma so somehow we don't have that so our proof of invariance is different so this proof of invariance this is like actually different this is different uh, from uh, i'll say oshwat zabo and in because particular we don't yeah was, yeah the oshwat zabo situation is like the analogous of what's happening in cyber beaten Field, that's right that's right yeah it's exactly yeah, analogous two plus larger than two larger or equal than two is fine but yeah yeah that's right and particular... in the agar flur they need to pass like i understand they they need it... to assume it first and then they prove that you don't need yeah so they, they need to be two plus three first they prove b2 plus three is an invariant greater than equal to three is an invariant and then they they have a so, so the reason how, how can they reduce from b2 plus greater than equal to three to greater than equal to two is that uh, they have a uh, connect some uh, formula with cp2 bar so if you connect some with cp2 bar it doesn't change the mixed invariant cp2 bar not cp2 so uh, or or um, uh, no, uh, or cp2 yeah so they have a connect some formula with cp2 or something like that so basically they can reduce go from the b2 plus equals two case to the b2 plus equals three case we don't have that so the, and this proof is different so this proof is actually harder like let me just say why this is slightly harder because what they can do is like so we are actually very constrained we like the only sort of place where one of cobordism maps are defined in zero one times s3 you only have cobordism maps when the underlying four manifold is the product it's zero one times s3 but in higgard floor homology you have a map for any underlying cobordism any underlying four manifold so you don't have a so 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 for higgard floor homology you can make the cut anywhere and your underlying four manifold could be anything but for our cuts our cuts has to be very specific the cuts in particular the cut has to be like a has s3 itself for them, they can they, their cut could be any three manifold. They can cut by any three manifold. For us, we we can only cut by S three. So it's it's more constrained. So, but we can still we still get to do the invariance proof, but we can only do it when the B two plus well cross cap number is at least three. So I actually don't know what happens with cross cap number two. We can define something, but I don't know if it's an invariant or or if it depends on the surface. But that's the story. Okay, so so this is a story. Let me. Uh, say okay uh, let me say a little bit about computations or some properties of this so some properties or actually some computations as well so so the interesting computation actually is like we just borrowed so there's this um, uh, papers by uh, sunberg swan so sunberg swan had a paper where they showed that, uh, so you know, you have this one of cobordism maps, but these are very hard to compute, okay? But they actually computed it for two different uh, cobordisms between the same knots. So two different, in fact, these are slice disks. So two different uh, cobordisms, um, yeah. So like their examples would be like, uh, and, and they showed that the maps are actually different, okay? So so they, they had like some, uh, you know, what is what is my picture again? So here is this thing and then they had a fixed knot and then they had two different slice disks for it so let me i'll draw it like light blue this is a disk and this is another disk so they had two slice disks for it and they computed the coven of cobordism some maps so the coven of cobordism maps are going from like you know some version of the theory h uh, h of l so this is l h of l to h of like the unknot 
sorry, the empty link, H of the empty link, okay? So we have these maps from the sum common of like in any variant, like plus, minus, hat, infinity. So actually they're just doing the hat version. So in hat version, I have these two maps. So there is, I guess, the light blue map and the deep blue map for the two different disks. And they actually show that these two maps are different. So that shows that these two disks are not diffeomorphic. I mean, there's no diffeomorphism which takes this, the light blue disk to the deep blue disk. So they can distinguish disks by just using these maps. So that was an explicit computation and that's great. And then uh, later this sort of example was souped up by um, Hayden Sundberg. So this is like maybe more exciting. Hayden Sundberg give an example just like this but uh, for a specific link so so their so their hayden sunberg link was like let's call it the hayden sunberg link is uh, um so this link is the hayden sunberg link uh, it's 12 n three zero nine or something like that or uh, I, I don't know so there's there's some 12 crossing link or something like that and they constructed two disks like this where the, they are distinguished by their maps and Kovana homology, but these two disks, uh, so therefore they are not smoothly isotropic, but these are topologically isotropic, so, so, or something. So, so these are topologically isotropic. These are topologically isotropic. So that's more exciting okay so they found topological isotopic disks which are not smoothly isotopic so the way you prove topologically isotopic is you always appeal to some theorem by friedman so you appeal to some friedman theorem and show that they are topologically isotopic but then by this kovanov homology map you can distinguish them by the uh, oh actually i don't know the head and sunberg link sorry uh, let me just say this is not so okay, it, this link is not 12309 okay uh, I got it wrong. Anyways, so there is some link they construct. Okay, let's just call it the hidden Sunberg link. Okay, so there is some link they explicitly write down where uh, not actually they have some not that they write down and then these are topological isotopic but not smoothly so. So they have this map. Now what we can do is so these are of course disks. These are not non-orientable, so we don't get to play our game. But we can sort of like translate this example and then do this mixed invariant thing. So these are also distinguished by mixed invariants. So what we do is that we constructed uh, like it's not very hard. We constructed a sort of a cobordism. Okay, so our link is twelve three zero nine. Okay, here is our knot. So this is twelve three zero nine, and and then this is the Hayden Sunberg knot. This is the Hayden Sunberg knot, and we constructed sort of like a cross cap number three. So this is a cross cap number. So this is a RP2 connect sum, RP2 connect sum, RP2. I mean, I guess minus two disks. It's a knotted, of course. It's a knotted RP2. It's a, it's, it's a cross cap number, an explicit cross cap number three cobordism, knotted one from uh, this link, this knot 12. N309 to the head and Sunberg thing. So we constructed one of this. And then, so this we did. And then what we had is like, we can then fit it to this, the head and Sunberg disks. So they have two disks. There is this light blue disk and the deep blue disk. So we can fit it to both of them. So we get two cross cut number three cobordisms from this knot 12 and 309 to the empty link. Okay, so we get two of them. And then we can say that these two are distinguished by the mixed invariant. So these two sort of knotted uh, uh, non-orientable cobordisms are distinguished by their mixed invariants, by the mixed invariants. Okay. So, so, but it is, it's nothing like extra in some, okay, this is a little bit extra because we added a bunch. So this is actually slightly stronger than the Hayden Sunberg result. And also we are using a different sort of invariant. But the point is that uh, this is just a proof of sort of like uh, pr uh, of, of principle that, okay, in some, in theory, this invariant can distinguish like uh, exotically knotted things. So of course, these things are topologically isotropic. So these are, these, these two surfaces, this, they still remain topologically isotropic, of course. These, of course, are still are still topologically isotopic. I mean, that's because they were topological isotopic beforehand. I mean, these, all these isotopies are relative boundary. So they were topological isotopic beforehand, so they're still topological isotopic, but they're still not smoothly isotopic. Okay, so, 
So that's that. Um, but of course, actually, in this case, they can even be distinguished by the actual maps and Kovana homology. So you don't really need the mixed invariant, but but you have the mixed invariant. And then a few more properties. Um, so one thing is like we, I just talked about it, that if you connect some with an unknotted RP2 or an unknotted RP2 bar, the mixed invariant vanishes. So I just write this. So this vanishes after connect connected summing with unknotted rp2 or rp2 bar okay so what is rp2 and rp2 bar these are like sort of exist some very specific uh, uh, uh cobordisms they kind of are like this that you take you you take the empty link then you you do a birth so you you do a birth and you produce like some uh, um, some unknot, and then you do a Reitermeister one move. So that's still the unknot. Uh, so this you can do in two ways. Okay, so you can like do the positive clasp or the negative clasp, and then you sort of do a saddle. But that actually is a non-orientable saddle. So if you do the saddle right there, it sort of becomes. Uh, let's see. Do this. So it kind of becomes like that, and it's still the unknot. So you sort of do a rider master move back to the unknot, and then you kill it. So that's RP2 or RP2 bar, depending on whether you do the positive class or the negative class. So that has one birth, one death, and one saddle. So it topologically must be RP2. Okay, so, so that's RP2 or RP2 bar. But if you connect some with this like really simple unknotted RP2 or RP2 bar, you always get the zero thing. Okay, so, so there are like some other properties like that. So these are mostly like vanishing properties. So you get this sort of vanishing properties. Maybe I'll mention one more. So this is like the slightly disappointing one. Okay, this is, like the, this is the disappointing vanishing result. Okay, but it, that's the way it, it works. That if I have a closed connected uh, non-orientable cobordism, I guess, non-orientable cobordism. Okay, I mean again the usual sort of assumption that the cross cap number is at least three. Okay, but if I if it's like closed, that means it has no boundary and it's connected. Okay, so some picture like it will look like this that. Um, the the cobordism is entirely sort of in in here okay then uh, the mixed invariant is zero so it's not very good at sort of i mean you can still play this game you can still like do a cut and everything you can still do a cut and everything but it'll actually get zero so uh, yeah, so that way, so it's not good it, it's it's still okay for doing cobordisms like this where one side is empty so you know here is a cobordism where one side is the empty link but if both sides the empty link it's not going to be very strong but actually uh, it's still plausible well, sorry possible at least i don't know if it's plausible but it's possible that it's not it's interesting for disconnected cobordisms so if it's a closed disconnected cobordisms like, like if it has two components or something then we don't our proof doesn't work so our proof only works for connected cobordisms so maybe for disconnected closed cobordisms it is maybe interesting but i don't know if anybody is interested in disconnected non-orientable cobordisms so so for connected non-orientable cobordisms like closed surfaces it actually doesn't give you any information okay so so that was but but that, that's what it what it is okay so maybe i'll just like state that and um so okay these are the properties this is kind of the construction and it's a good time to stop so i'll stop here okay uh thank you